In our current global context of accelerating ecological breakdown, political instability, and socioeconomic inequality, a robust body of literature suggests that it is inequality stemming from capitalism's demand for unlimited growth and overconsumption in the global north that is destroying the planet and making life worse for most people. The costs include climate change, the demise of ecosystems and biodiversity, and for humans, poor physical and psychological health, long working hours, urban congestion, pollution, and exponentially increasing socioeconomic inequality. We are meeting or exceeding thresholds for the climate, biodiversity, and the nitrogen cycle, which is necessary to sustain all life on Earth. Most of the world lives in poverty. Billions of people experience hunger, lack of affordable health care, inadequate shelter and sanitation, and material deprivation that amounts to a lack of freedom. And yet, for hundreds of years, and especially over the last 70, the world has been getting much, much richer. In other words, inequality has been growing at an exponential rate. Globally, as of 2022, 1.2% of people hold 47.8% of the world's wealth, or 221.7 trillion US dollars, while 53.2% of people hold only 1.1% of the world's wealth, or 5 trillion US dollars, with an average wealth of less than $10,000 per person. And, both resulting from and driving the unprecedented concentration of income and wealth today is a concentration of power. United Nations researchers report, the world is in a state of fracture and at its heart is inequality. Research has shown that inequality is highly detrimental for our societies and economies, undermining economic development and poverty reduction, well-being and health, democracy, participation and social cohesion, as well as social, environmental, and economic sustainability. Groups made more vulnerable due to race, ethnicity, caste, citizenship status, gender, sexual orientation, age, disability, and other factors, as well as developing countries, especially in the global south, are particularly harmed. In the face of human suffering, the 20th century social contract delivered social progress and greater well-being for some, but as it did not fully grapple with the ramifications of colonialism and slavery, it excluded many, many others. It also crucially ignored planetary boundaries by organizing progress exclusively around economic growth. This left the door open for neoliberalism, with its ruthless focus on profit at any cost, and led directly to our current global ecological crisis, which the scientific community agrees is reaching a point of no return. The term sustainable development and the policies it engendered were initially seen as a way to address the limited capacity of planetary resources to meet human needs. But the term itself is an oxymoron. Scientific evidence tells us our planet cannot sustain endless human development. It is also clear that we cannot address economic, social, political, and environmental crises in isolation from each other. Thankfully, there is growing consensus around the need to harness the concurrent crises of inequality and environmental destruction for a new eco-social contract that delivers social, economic, political, and environmental justice. Proposed models integrate alternative economic approaches which center environmental and social justice and rebalance state-market-society-nature relations, transformative social policies underpinned by a fair fiscal contract, and reimagined multilateralism and strengthened solidarity. An alternative economic approach being put forward is a social and solidarity economy, which facilitates environmentally and socially sustainable production, exchange, and consumption, recenters the commons, institutionalizes collective action, and seeks a socioeconomic equilibrium in which everyone has what they need to live well. Transformative social policies being put forward take a long term, universal, institutionalized, human rights based approach to social protection. For example, universal child benefits, social pensions, extension of coverage to informal and self-employed workers, basic income guarantees, minimum wage policies, housing cooperatives, health mutuals, investment in domestic energy efficiency, and tax incentives for energy-poor households, investment in energy-efficient social housing, a Green New Deal, and many, many others. They invest in a healthy, educated workforce, redistribute market income to increase equality, introduce robust programs to protect people against life cycle and market 
market risks while supporting marginalized groups through measures minimizing discrimination and implementation, redistribute unpaid care work in society, and assure the financing of these policies at a national level through taxation which targets high incomes, excessive windfall profits, and wealth accumulation, and provides incentives for sustainable production and consumption, and at a global level through redistribution, sustainable access to finance, reductions in external debt in the global south, and curbed financialization, tax competition, and capital flight. Lastly, a reformed global governance system is put forward that fosters solidarity, peace, cooperation, and sustainability through alliance building to harness the power of the many to rein in the influence of the few and rebalance existing power structures. Importantly, implementing this new eco-social contract will mean abandoning the myths of self-correcting markets, endlessly renewable natural resources, and trickle-down development. Asthma is the inflammation of the respiratory system that restricts airflow in the lungs and leads to hyper-responses such as difficulty breathing, wheezing, and tightness in the chest. Asthma affects people of color, specifically children, and those living in high-poverty neighborhoods more than those who are living in wealthy neighborhoods. Asthma is so severe in the Bronx, especially the South Bronx, that it has been nicknamed Asthma Alley. In 2017, 17% of children 13 years old or younger living in the Bronx were diagnosed with asthma. This compares to the 11% of children diagnosed with asthma collectively in Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, and Staten Island. Common triggers such as dust, air pollution, diesel exhaust particles, bugs, mice, mold, and smoking can be found in and near substandard and poorly maintained buildings which are commonly found in high poverty neighborhoods. These triggers can lead to hospitalization. In 2018, per 10,000 children aged 5 to 17 years old, 309 children living in the Bronx had an asthma attack that resulted in an emergency department visit. This compares to the 183 children per 10,000 living in the remaining boroughs having an asthma attack which resulted in an emergency department visit. Emergency department visits can lead to missed school or work days. One huge environmental factor that impacts asthma levels is air pollution. The Cross Bronx Expressway cuts directly through the Bronx. Eric Adams has dedicated $2 million to studies and to search for solutions to address the asthma rates caused by the Cross Bronx Expressway. Some of the status shows the neighborhoods that are being split by the Cross Bronx Expressway have some of the most emergency department visits related to asthma attacks. In addition to the excessive air pollution caused from the Cross Bronx Expressway, the industrialization throughout the Bronx is also problematic as it leads to even more vehicle traffic, spewing exhaust, and further polluting the air. Hunts Point is the main perpetrator in the Bronx. Hunts Point has been an industrial and commercial space since the end of World War I. Because Hunts Point is located on the peninsula of the Bronx, it is an ideal location for shipping and distributing goods to this tri-state area. Hunts Point Cooperative Market has over 50 independent food businesses that rely completely on trucks. Diesel trucks make about 15,000 trips through Hunts Point, which only exasperates the exhaust pollution in the Bronx, which is a key factor in the high asthma rates in the Bronx. The Mobilization Act is based around the idea of reducing carbon emissions from large buildings in New York City with the goal of making New York City carbon neutral by 2050. If all goes as planned, the Climate Mobilization Act is expected to reduce New York City's overall emissions by 10% by 2030, eliminate 6 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, create more than 26,000 green jobs by 2030, and of course, make New York City carbon neutral by 2050. This act includes two main laws, Local Law 97 and Local Law 95. Local Law 97 is a huge contributor in the effort to make New York City buildings more eco-friendly. Local Law 97 puts an emissions cap on buildings larger than 25,000 square feet or buildings that are on the same tax lot that collectively exceed 50,000 square feet. This will make energy sources like heat and air conditioning electric rather than burning fossil fuels as many of them currently are. The idea of this law is to limit the amount of carbon emissions produced by the largest buildings in New York City. This law goes into effect in 2024. The Local Law 97 Advisory Board recommends the use of electric building systems as they are the most effective way to decrease carbon emissions and not exceed the new carbon emissions cap. 
This wall unit is an electric heater and cooling unit. It is recommended that these replace the traditional New York City radiators and box air conditioning units. Local Law 97 is also part of Bill de Blasio's Climate Mobilization Act. The Energy Star rating is just a fancy way of saying the energy efficiency score. You've probably seen these posted on the outside of large buildings. These buildings are actually required as part of the law to have the rating visibly posted by a building entrance. This score is only applied for buildings that are larger than 25,000 square feet or multiple buildings on one tax lot that totals 100,000 square feet. This score comes from the grading tool used by the United States Protection Agency. The score takes the building's energy and water performance and compares it to that of similar buildings in a similar climate. A is an ideal grade with 85 to 100, making the building very energy efficient using a reasonable amount of emissions based energy and water. Whereas D is the lowest grade at 54 or lower, making it a very inefficient use of energy and water. This grading system is useful because it draws attention to how much energy and water is being used in the building and if it is a reasonable amount or it'll expose the building for being wasteful with carbon emissions. The city of Atlanta has leased 381 acres of Wilani Forest to the Atlanta Police Foundation to build a militarized police training facility. It will cost $90 million, $30 million from the city, and $60 million from corporate funders and their philanthropic arms like the Atlanta Police Foundation and the Atlanta Committee for Progress, which is composed of over 40 corporate elites, including the CEOs of Coca-Cola, Home Depot, and Cox, who all stand to profit from the new facility. It will include a mock city to practice urban warfare, tear gas, and explosives testing, dozens of shooting ranges, and a Black Hawk helicopter landing pad. Proponents and city officials say the site is needed to replace inadequate training facilities and would become one of the largest such centers in the country. Protesters say it's being built to further the surveillance of the population, stifle dissent, gentrify the area, and that it will destroy 85 acres of forest belonging to one of the four so-called lungs of Atlanta. They've dubbed the proposed facility Cop City and have been voicing their dissent since its announcement. Cop City was announced in 2020 amid street protests about police misconduct and the state-sponsored killing of people of color. The land had been earmarked in 2017 as a key piece of a city design plan to create green space and recreation options for an underserved part of Atlanta surrounded by majority black neighborhoods. The city council approved the park, but the city's leaders then made a deal to lease the land to the Atlanta Police Foundation to build Cop City. The land itself is in a legal gray zone. Because because it's in unincorporated DeKalb County and not the city limits, a project would normally need the approval of the DeKalb County government, but because it's owned by the city, state law allows the project to sidestep some elements of local approval. The people who are the actual site's neighbors were given no real say in the matter. The Atlanta City Council approved Cop City by a 10-4 to 4 vote after only 17 hours of public comment, almost all of which was in opposition. Among those voting in favor was then City Councilman Dickens, who is now Atlanta's mayor. As it was an election year, the Atlanta Police Foundation made it clear it would attack any politician who voted against the plan. Cop City was immediately met with intense environmental and equity concerns from two overlapping groups, environmental activists and policing abolitionists. Critics are accusing Atlanta, a city that's proud of its urban forest, of canceling its own plan to bring more open green space to communities that have already put up with undesirable facilities like landfills, water treatment plants, and truck yards. Opponents of Cop City are urging the city to take up that original plan, and recently, a new vision of that plan has emerged, which includes options for linking existing parks and connecting them to Atlanta's Beltline, a loop used by pedestrians and cyclists. This is both a fight against police militarization and an effort to preserve Metro Atlanta's dwindling forests. Protesters descended on the wooded site almost immediately, camping in tents and interfering with site development. Tension between protesters and law enforcement has been escalating for the last few months. On January 18, 2023, police shot and killed a forest defender protester, Manuel Paez Teran, a non-binary person who went by the name Tortuguita. As might have been expected, police officials claimed Tortuguita shot first and hit a state trooper. In body camera footage that was later released after police said none would be, one officer said that the cop had been shot by fellow police. A previous independent autopsy ordered by Tortuguita's family found that their hands were raised when they were shot. The DeKalb County Medical Examiner's Office finally released its official autopsy report last week after considerable delay, which found no trace of gunpowder residue 
tattoo on Tortuguita's hands. The young activist was shot at least 57 times, including in their head, torso, hands, and legs. The medical examiner ruled the death a homicide. The militarized raid that led to Tortuguita's death is exactly the sort of counterinsurgency police tactic that the facility would be dedicated to perpetuating. Tortuguita's killing shows how high the stakes of stopping Cop City are. In the three months it took for the autopsy report to be released, cops have continued to attack the protest camp with violent raids and indiscriminate arrests. 42 people have been charged with domestic terrorism for their participation in the movement, with arrest warrants citing flimsy grounds including protesters having mud on their shoes and the number for a legal support group scrawled on their arms. There is no body camera footage directly capturing the moments when cops shot Tortuguita 57 times, and no police have been charged in their killing. While some of the land has been cleared, no construction has started yet. Opposition to Cop City has only grown, both locally and nationally, as it is a powerful symbol of the trend to militarize policing which began after 9-11. The Georgia Constitution establishes a local initiative process for counties and Georgia state, and the Georgia Code establishes the local initiative processes for cities. According to the law, the city of Atlanta and DeKalb County both allow for the holding of binding referendums on any subject on which local residents are eligible to vote. This means that both the City Council and DeKalb Commission can move to hold a referendum on the construction of Cop City. Because both the City of Atlanta and unincorporated DeKalb County have a stake in whether or not Cop City gets built, activists are now working to get enough signatures for referendums to be added to November's ballot in each locality and to hold off construction until then. Before discussing the events of Hurricane Maria, it is important to first understand the history of Puerto Rico as a U.S. Commonwealth. Puerto Rico became a colony of the U.S. in 1898 as a result of the Spanish-American War. In 1917, Puerto Ricans were granted U.S. citizenship and afforded constitutional rights with exceptions. Puerto Ricans can serve in the military but cannot vote for the U.S. president. Under tax law, Puerto Rico is a foreign entity, yet under maritime law, it is part of the U.S. Today, Puerto Rico is considered a commonwealth of the U.S., with the ability to establish an internal self-government while still technically being a U.S. territory. Past votes and surveys show that Puerto Ricans feel divided on whether the country should remain a commonwealth, become an official state, or an independent nation. Prior to Hurricane Maria, Puerto Rico was already facing political and economic distress from an economic crisis, unstable infrastructure, and other issues stemming from its standing as an unincorporated territory with commonwealth status. In 2016, the U.S. Congress passed a federal law called the PROMESA Act. PROMESA stands for Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, or PROMIS in Spanish. While PROMESA addressed the most urgent issue of fiscal responsibility and debt restructuring, it did not provide needed tools to promote economic growth, such as providing workers in Puerto Rico access to an earned income tax credit or address the inadequacy in federal support for health care in Puerto Rico. In September of 2017, Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico a little over a week after Hurricane Irma, causing massive destruction to the country's power grid and infrastructure. This Category 5 hurricane destruction paved the way for a massive healthcare crisis and revealed the multitude of fundamental problems that already plagued Puerto Rico before the storm. These problems include the relationship between Puerto Rico and the U.S., which affected the ability of Puerto Rico to effectively respond to the immediate crisis and support an economic recovery. According to the Stafford Act passed in 1988, the federal government is responsible for providing disaster and emergency assistance to local, state, tribal, territorial, and insular governments, private nonprofit organizations, and individuals who are affected by major disasters and emergencies. Under this act, Puerto Rico was owed assistance from the U.S. after Hurricane Maria. While former President Donald Trump did declare Hurricane Maria a major disaster and ordered federal assistance, many criticized the overall response of the U.S. as compared to previous emergencies. Despite the recent passing of Hurricane Irma, the government of Puerto Rico did not have the proper structures in place to handle the imminent emergency. Responsibility for managing emergency repairs on essential utilities then fell on the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, to properly prepare for the disruption in communication systems, the power grid, and access to clean water. The criminally slow response to the disaster caused citizens and onlookers abroad to critique the agency. In its own defense, FEMA claimed that the island geography of Puerto Rico made logistics and getting supplies where they needed to go difficult. Critics of this response said that previous administrations had plans in place in case a Category 4 or 5 hurricane ever hit Puerto Rico. FEMA should have had logistics ready for when an island territory faced a crisis. Potential solutions to the ongoing crisis suggested by the government and citizens of Puerto Rico include 
announcing a sustained commitment to Puerto Rico's future, resolving the inadequacy of Puerto Rico's Medicaid program, and providing the needed capital and capacity to rebuild. In an article published in the Social Science and Medicine Journal, authors Benak and others adopt an eco-social perspective stating, in September 2017, the passage of Hurricanes Irma and Maria caused a public health care disaster with large-scale death and destruction. Paradoxically, this catastrophe has made visible the need to evaluate the critical social environmental situation of this country and to analyze the underlying social factors contributing to the problems caused by the hurricanes. For decades, this country has been suppressed by colonial domination, exploitation of the workforce, and health discrimination. It has been a laboratory where colonial practices have institutionalized social control, racism, and inequality with profound negative effects on society, quality of life, and health equality. Puerto Rico is a resource-rich island with a variety of renewable resources in the form of solar, wind, hydropower, and biomass energy, yet has relied primarily on imported fossil fuels to meet its energy needs. Under the Puerto Rico Energy Public Policy Act, the country's primary electric power company, PREPA, must obtain 40% of its electricity supply from renewable resources by 2025, 60% by 2040, and 100% by 2050. As of today, solar energy is Puerto Rico's fastest growing source of renewable generation. On March 18, 2023, residents in Arjuntas, Puerto Rico celebrated the launch of a community-owned microgrid. Businesses hooked up to the microgrid won't have to rely on expensive polluting diesel generators to keep their doors open if long-term blackouts come again. The new system means they can also help provide essential services to people in the surrounding areas, storing medications like insulin in commercial freezers and charging laptops and phones. But for some of those involved in the project, those solar panels and batteries also have political implications. Executive Director of Casa Pueblo de Arjunta states, We want to help decolonize Puerto Rico. It's not just about solar panels for people to have power after a hurricane. It is much deeper and more important for the future of the island. Residents in Puerto Rico pay more than double the U.S. average electricity rate for the least reliable electrical system in the country, which is decades old and in a state of disrepair. Historically, colonialism has helped keep people in small towns like Arjuntas poor, while transferring wealth to elites in San Juan and the U.S. mainland. This change could break that system and allow businesses and residents to pay lower rates for electricity while profits are invested in maintenance and local community development rather than benefiting power companies and fossil fuel producers.